Good morning, Greater New York Dental Programs in the New York area. First of all, I hope everyone is staying safe, healthy, and warm. Um, the weather in the New York area has been a little crazy recently. That being said, we thank you for taking the time for joining us this evening, this morning, sorry. Um, I'm Adam Dreyfus, your local representative here to help you in any way possible. We thank you for choosing DSG as your partner today, tomorrow, and for the future. As you've heard from me before, education is a major part of the dental industry, and we hope that you will continue to join these courses and many more that we are putting on. <clears throat> if there's anything that, I, that DSG or I can do, please reach out at any time to us as we are here to support you in your endeavors and to continue to grow together. With that, again, I thank you for your time, your support. We, we really appreciate everything that you do for, for us. And without further ado, I introduce Dennis Urban, who's going to share with you this morning, protocol procedure and patient acceptance on implant dentures, part one. Dennis, take it away. All right. Well, thank you, Adam. Thank you, Jessica. And thank you, everybody, for joining us this morning. Um, and uh, today, we're gonna, like Adam mentioned, we're going to discuss protocol, procedure, and patient acceptance with implant dentures. And usually, this, can, this course can probably run a whole day, you know, but uh, we, we have all the pertinent information here. We broke it down into two parts. And this morning, we're going to cover, you know, first, probably, uh, it's going to be a little bit on uh, over dentures, then we'll get into a little bit of uh, hybrid type dentures. But, and we'll talk about the market overview also. So, um, that's me. You don't have to be already introduced. <laughs> uh, 40 years in the industry. Uh, I think most of you know me. I over for over 40 years, and I've got to travel the world, uh, teaching and lecturing and learning uh, on uh, on denture technology. And uh, so I'm I'm really happy to be here this morning. It's something I enjoy, and I want to share my knowledge. And everything I'm sharing this morning is on products and techniques that have been made me successful, have made clinicians successful, and patients accepting uh, these types of cases over the years. So we'll go over mill bar design with overdentures. We'll talk about implant overdentures directly over abutments and root attachments um, and uh, types of attachments with mill bar design, including locator attachments. Um, and we'll talk about hybrid uh, design protocol and procedure, including chair side conversions on new and existing dentures. Uh, and uh, here's another photo here of a conversion that was done on, uh, uh, on a uh, hybrid type denture. And, uh, but first we're gonna start with implant dentures. And we're gonna talk about science, technique, and application. You know, there are a number of advantages that over dentures have over complete dentures. Uh, many clinicians believe that complete dentures are not an appropriate restoration, and instead, on, especially on lowers. And I believe a minimum standard of care should be two implants on a mandible and on an over denture. And with the many implant and attachment systems on the market, the cost of an implant over denture has become very affordable. You know, wherever we have teeth, roots, or implants, we tend to retain the bone in those areas. And this is one of the most important benefits of overdentures uh, when compared to complete dentures. Um, and patients who are restored with overdentures chew more effectively and have more comfort. And for the patient, it raises that confidence level and self-esteem knowing that they'll be able to eat most foods and have a stable denture and not have to use denture adhesive. There's a lot of pluses and a lot of pros uh, to having an implant overdenture. So, uh, so let's get started. Uh, and I would like to stress quality materials and proven techniques are a reflection of your talent. So we try to uh, talk about uh, you know, the right materials and the right techniques that's gonna uh, uh, yield to patient uh, uh, satisfaction and patient acceptance. I'm just gonna look, talk a little bit about market research. I do this in all my seminars and I get information from surveys that are done. You probably saw some of this in uh, my full denture seminar, but this is a little bit different because we're talking about implant dentures right now. So. The majority of the United States lab survey claimed they had a dramatic increase in implant dentures in the past five years, just like full dentures. Uh, and um, dentists who would like to increase their implant denture in hybrid business, according to dental products reports, was about 70%, which is great because, you know, it's becoming simplified and the technology out there now makes it a lot easier for you. It makes it predictable. And with the communication between the laboratory and the clinician, it's a, it's a win-win situation. So more income opportunities for, uh, for dental laboratories, dental manufacturers, technicians, and dentists. Uh, and uh, so, but the income opportunities are there, but also it's uh, um, solutions for the patient, you know, if they're not happy with a uh, traditional denture. So one of the most important things on these types of cases is communication. We need to communicate effectively 
and we need to communicate on case uh, preferences and uh, procedures uh, with you, the clinician, the oral surgeon, periodontist, and get these everything in line and know what the outcome of these, uh, these cases are going to be before we even start. You know, we have to meet the patient's expectations, and if we cannot meet them, we have to decide on what design is going to meet those expectations. So again, we, we depend on the dentist, surgeon, the periodontist for the clinical knowledge, assessment of the patient, appropriate treatment planning, uh, detailed information on the RX form, uh, all digital photography and digital, uh, digital technology. And we'll talk about a little about digital technology later on when we talk about surgical guides. And from us, the certified dental technician in a laboratory, you depend on our technical expertise on procedures and materials. We'll give you the appropriate feedback on impressions, bites, shades, even on this particular situation, attachments. Are they going to be the right att attachments for specific cases? Sometimes what we get in the laboratory from clinicians are not going to, uh, uh, and request uh, realistically are not going to work with uh, some certain cases because we don't have the intraocclusal space that we need sometimes for these attachments. So, and we have, we communicate with case planning and the dentist uh, and or on our and the oral surgeon and we depend on digital and technology also. So real important communication is key for the success of these types of cases. And just like we would have for, for full dentures, we have to have the clinical preclinical interview, especially with patients who have existing full dentures and they wanna transfer over to an implant denture. You know, and these are some of the things we, we, we talk about. And, you know, usually I'll go into each specific point and elaborate more, there's just not enough time, but, you know, Ask the patient, what are your specific concerns and limitations? How long have you been a dentalist? How many dentures have you had since your tooth loss? How did you lose your teeth? Have you ever considered implants? So, uh, and talk, you know, ask about patients' complaints and look at the history of their dentalism, the support of the denture, the stability, the retention. Is there enough bone, bone mass there, or bone quantity to do an implant uh, over denture case? And then we also have to look at the traditional way we look at full dentures, even with implant over denture cases, with border extensions, centric relation, the BDO, and phonetics. Do we have enough room in the in intraocclusal space for, for proper phonetics and aesthetics? If not, we might have to go to another type of design on these cases. And of course, occlusion, including lingualized occlusion and opposing dentition. Everything has to be taken into consideration for a successful case. So let's talk about the ultimate result with the implant dentures. Okay, so once we introduce attachments to the, the case design, we, we gain three additional advantages. And the overdenture will be more stable and a, than a complete denture, and it leads to more greater uh, comfort and better aesthetics. Now you'll be able to determine how occlusal forces are handled, and you'll be able to, to, to have the choice of rigid and resilient attachments from where to choose which to choose from. And we'll talk about that in a minute. And therefore, you can decide if the overdenture will be supported by more by the abutments or if the ridge will handle more of the load. And we can, then we can achieve uh, superior aesthetics. So, you know, we're no longer, longer relying on a closed palate on the upper and heavily extended flanges on these, some types of these uh, implant overdenture cases. And we must be sure that the flanges do not engage the tissue undercuts more than one millimeter. And if they do, we'll shorten the flanges so they don't create a different path of insertion than those indicated by the attachment. So, it's best to begin each case by using a putty matrix on a denture setup to see what kind of room we have to work with. So let's get started here. I'd like to start with this quote here, and it's by Dr. Stamina Strong and Joseph Massad, who you might've heard of, uh, and this is from Dental Economics. And they, they claim, and they quote in this article, the removable implant over denture has become a well-established option, if not the most preferred for the edentulous patient. And critical to the success of this procedure is not only an accurate impression of the implant abutments, but also extremely vital is the detail of the entire indentulous ridges, ridges and peripheral borders to maintain stability. So you have a combination of the ridge and implant support and uh, retention. And we want, it is important that we want to deflect unwanted food entrapment around the denture margins. So I like this quote, I like to put this in my presentation because it reminds me why we're doing these types of dentures. So let's go through a little bit more of market research here. And this, some of this information was taken by a book. It's a great book on implant overdentures by Dr. Hamid Shafi uh, by Blackstone Publishing. 
And uh, I was fortunate to work with Dr. Shafi for over, over two years traveling around the country and doing lectures and doing hands-on courses. And he has two versions of this book here and it's on implant overdentures and you can get it, uh, I'm not, and you can get it online and Amazon. It's a great book and it's a reference book that you can really utilize for implant overdentures. And some of this material that I haven't uh, quoted here is from his book. And um, uh, it's over 20 million Americans, now more are edentalists, you know, more than 20. And the undergraduate programs uh, across the country over the years, you know, realized that two implants for lower overdentures are the recommended treatment choice of believing so many fully edentalists. And because you know, they looked at the amount of bone loss that dentistry has seen in fully edentalist patients uh, during past generations, and it was really frightening to consider, you know, between the pounding of the ridge on, on lower dentures and especially on lower dentures, uh, we had a lot of, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the um, uh, bone loss in those uh, dentalist ridges. And dentistry at that time had taught that bone atrophy, atrophy was normal, you know, and we now know that two implants in the anterior mandible will stop this progressive bone loss and preserve the ridge. And we'll talk about the amount of implants later on when we get into more, what's pretty much acceptable and what's going to be uh, beneficial for the patient when we get into more of the hybrid type cases. So what, did he, what is the purpose of an implant over denture? Well, we want to create natural aesthetics. We want to enhance facial appearance. And we want to compensate for that lost soft tissue, enhance the function with the right occlusal scheme, with the you know, lingualized occlusion. We want to create uh, and eliminate, actually, any off-axis stress on those implants by utilizing specific uh, types of occlusion. And most patients can afford one type of implant over because they're less expensive than with a uh, fixed prosthesis. In some of the indications, compromised support on a conventional denture, like we men mentioned, poor neuromuscular coordination, the low tolerance of mucosal tissues for a removable acrylic base. And that could be because the denture is not fitting correctly. It could be the occlusal scheme or the occlusion is not correct or the patient can't tolerate an, an acrylic base. And uh, the patient's dissatisfaction with complete dentures and desire for more stability and comfort. And of course, at times, congenital or oral defects that lead to oral rehabilitation. And at the end of part two, I'll elaborate a little bit on that a little bit more with a case that I, I did a couple of years ago for a young patient who had a congenital and oral defect. And we, we worked with him on an uh, implant overdenture that was very, very successful. So let's look at the three basic types of implant overdentures. Well, mainly tissue supported overdentures are the ones I've just talked about with the two prefabricated individual attachments and the overdenture is mainly tissue borne. Then we get into more of a tissue implant supported overdenture. It's more implant borne compared to the previous type. And we use two implants and a resilient bar attachment assembly. And we'll talk a little bit about when we should use, utilize a bar and when we shouldn't. You know, so then we have the fully implant supported dentures. And that's not just for overdentures, this could be for hybrid dentures also. And when an attachment assembly that usually contains four or more implants and the attachment assembly transfers all those masticatory forces to the supporting implants and minimal flange and tissue coverage is required. But when that minimal flange and tissue coverage is required, we wanna make sure that it's cleansable and the patient can clean it easily and have good oral hygiene. And some of the treatment factors, um, additionally to what I mentioned earlier, we have to look at bone quantity. You know, we have to have the right bone quantity for these and we have to try to meet the patient's expectations for a treatment outcome. You know, and like I mentioned also with oral hygiene and patient compliance, jaw relationship and the distance between the upper and lower alveolar ridge. We wanna make sure we have, especially when we're doing an upper and lower open denture, we have, we have to have that intraocclusal space and the amount of space we need for attachments, acrylic, teeth, bars. You have to look at this whole entire project before we even consider what type of case we're going to be making. And some of the common mistakes in constructing implant over denture is a poor treatment planning distorted impressions and inaccurate master models, as well as a working model, poor fitting frameworks, and the wrong choices of materials and attachments. And I mentioned a little earlier about the wrong materials and attachments. You know, uh, I've gotten take cases in the laboratory where they've asked for certain attachments and we couldn't even get a denture tooth over it uh, because it was so, it, there wasn't enough room. And sometimes there was, uh, this was over a bar. And the conclusion on these types of cases, we couldn't make a bar. We had to go directly to the implant and directly to the root attachment uh, because otherwise there wouldn't have been enough intraocclusal intro space for these types of attachments. So some of these things we can you know, take into consideration when we're planning these cases. And a successful implant supported denture, over denture, we want a stress-free fit of the attachment assembly. 
good oral hygiene, biocompatibility of the chosen materials, high biomechanical strength of the chosen materials. And uh, in part two, we'll elaborate on that a little bit more. And that includes acrylic. You know, many of the acrylics I see used in, in the dental industry, they're, they're, they're not strong enough. They don't have that high impact resistance with flexural strength. When you're recommending acrylics, you wanna recommend an acrylic that's gonna have a high uh, impact resistance, but it needs to have flexural strength. Why? Because you're gonna have brittleness. How many times over the years have you heard of uh, implant overdentures and, and hyperdentures cracking and breaking because of stress? The amount of stress that you have on an overdenture and uh, in a hybrid case is much more than you would have on a traditional denture. And because of the supporting materials uh, underneath between attachments and everything else, a bar, uh, that stress can create fractures and breakage. And, uh, and that's why we need some in, inner strength or inner mesh support on a lot of these types of dentures. So really important on, on the uh, biomechanical bio 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 strength of those, these materials. Functional and equilibrated occlusion. I mentioned lingualize a few times, and, you know, that's, and we'll talk about that more, but basically it's when that lingual cusp of the upper tooth falls right into the central fossa of the lower, and it creates, it eliminates rather any off axis stress on the implant or the ridge. And lingualized inclusion can be utilized in, in full dentures also, even without attachments and implants. So when I have natural looking aesthetics uh, with the right denture teeth and the right materials and absence of interference with normal phonetics, you know, we don't want to have to have so much material in the mouth without enough interoclusal space for these materials that the patient can't speak correctly. So we want to have, have it functional and aesthetic and the communication is key, like I mentioned before. So let's talk about with or without a bar. You know, a bar can achieve evenly distributed forces between the implants. So that's, that's a great feature and a plus. The direct method with an overdenture attachment incorporated into the denture base with a mat without a mill bar costs less and requires less vertical room. So that's the first thing we look at when we're prescribing these types of cases. And, and the final design of the case is determined what, 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 we have, what, what we have to work with intraorally, you know. But both methods require support from the tissue and the attachments. Just keep that in mind. So, uh, you know, keep in mind that the denture rests on the soft tissue and the attachments act only as a retentive element, preventing, preventing the denture from dislodging. Some of the advantages we talked about earlier is preserving bone, better chewing efficiency, peace of mind and security, stability and comfort. So, and, you know, we have fixed and fixed removable solutions pretty much for all types of patients' needs. You know, and we just have to uh, prescribe the right solution for them, you know, from removable solutions with uh, uh, implants and bar solutions with fixed removable and also with fixed uh, solutions with hybrids. So let's look at this patient here on the left hand side. This is without a denture. You know, look how his face is sunken in and, you know, really not much support. And in the middle here, in the middle picture, this is with an implant hybrid denture. You can see because of the flange is reduced on the implant hybrid denture, the patient really still doesn't have enough support here. So the solution for this patient with the, you know, he had, had enough bone, um, we had enough intraocclusal space to do the bar, but it really wasn't giving the patient a natural look. So decided on going with an overdenture with a flange. And this type of case, what we did with this is uh, uh, they actually utilized an, uh, that bar and uh, tapped into the bar and put attachments over the bar. And look at the nice overdenture with the flange here. Real natural look, fills out his lip, and it was functional and aesthetic. So these are the types of cases you want to, you know, we want to prescribe and look at all the over, uh, underlying factors for this, uh, these types of patients. So removable implant dentures, individual attachments versus a bar with attachments. How do we choose? As you can see on a lower picture, how much room, more room this takes up with the bar assembly. So let's look at the considerations with attachments only. So an ideal ridge structure is needed. For instance, a lower full denture on a patient with an ideal ridge and good bone structure can easily have an overdenture attachments and place in the final denture without the use of a milled bar. So, but we wanna make sure there's a metal substructure placed internally for strength. I get these questions all the time. Even last week I did a seminar, I got a question before the seminar. The dentures I prescribe are always breaking. Why are they breaking? And we came to the conclusion that there wasn't a substructure internally around the uh, attachments. You know, and the stress on the acrylic and uh, on these attachments is going to cause it to break. So um, we're going to talk about some options with these types of inner strengtheners uh, for these types of cases. So, And an upper denture will be functional with just attachments if the patient is in an ideal class one occlusion. That's something to consider there. So a deciding factor for a bar assembly. You know, often the anterior ridge on an upper has mobility. 
if the patient is not in ideal occlusion. And, and this pretty much causes a mesiodistal rock and it can put all the stress on the attachments. And this is when we consider a mill bar assembly on the upper. As you can, this is a, a dolder bar uh, attachment assembly on, on, uh, that you see below here. Uh, we don't get too many dolder bars anymore, but they work effectively, you know, and uh, we'll get into some different options on, uh, on attachments in a few minutes. So if the patient has a flat ridge, there'll be no tissue support and all of the pressure will be on the attachments. You know, in, if possible, a fixed case is better. But if we have a bar with horizontal lock attachments, even with locator attachments, they'll still act as a sort of a fixed patient removable prosthesis. So there is an answer to these types of cases, these types of scenarios when the uh, patient does have a flat ridge. So just go over, we're gonna go over the protocol a little bit on, on overdenture. We'll get into more protocol when we talk about hybrid type dentures, but pretty much the same protocol. Uh, it's a little bit different if you're making a bar. You know, first thing we're gonna do is have your preliminary impression. We're gonna make a custom tray impression. And then on a custom tray impression, you're pretty much gonna kind of uh, pick up those, um, uh, those caps or those, uh, those attachments. And, uh, and then we're gonna make a bite rim. And, uh, and at this time, um, we're gonna, if we're making a bar, we're gonna make a verification jig also. So we wanna make sure that impression is accurate. So we make the verification jig. And when it comes back to the laboratory, at this point, if everything looks good, this is when I'm going to make that inner uh, support structure, you know, with a, um, uh, either a mesh framework, a cast mesh framework, or the new types of materials that are out there now are the super polymers that are lighter and they're strong. We can utilize those types of materials also. And then uh, final insertion and attachment connection. The attachment connection can be done in the laboratory or it can be done intraorally on chair site. Let's look at some attachment choices. As all of you know, you probably pretty much know the locator. It's pretty much the most, one of the most popular attachments out there on the market today. And they constantly improve it. I mean, there's so many different options for locator attachments. And, uh, you know, it's a, it's, it's a great, great attachment. It's predictable and it works. You know, so, uh, you know, it's, it's for cast two attachments, for right to the root attachments, as you can see here. Uh, mill bar attachments where you can drill and tap, just like the case I talked about earlier, where we had to drill and tap that existing bar. And all you do is have a two, minute, two, two millimeter thread, screw these attachments on there, and you can actually convert an existing denture uh, at times over uh, these attachments. And of course, mil, uh, implant attachments. And pretty much compatible with all implant systems, as you can see here. So all these uh, abutments are pretty much compatible, all different heights, different sizes. You wanna make sure you get the right cuff height. And usually we'll do that in the laboratory. We'll measure the cuff height for you and get you all in the correct uh, um, abutments on these types of cases. But there's a lot to choose from, as you can see. It can be confusing, you know, but it really is not. It's, a, it's pretty much a predictable scenario when you're doing these types of overdenture cases. They work if you follow the protocol. So let's look at the root attachment system. And we do quite a bit of these uh, directly to root attachments on these types of cyst, uh, attachments also. And uh, this is done with either post and core attachments. We can cast a post and core with an attachment assembly connected to that post and core. And all you have to do is put the post and core in there and pick up the attachment in an impression and we'll do the rest. As you can see some photos here with the root attachment system. These work out great. You know, if they have you know, enough bone structure and, and you know, even rich structure in the, in the mouth, these work out tremendously great. So we have a, we've had a lot of success uh, on these types of attachments also. And this just shows you the post and core type of uh, preparation here on these types of attachments. And we can also utilize scan bodies on the digital side, you know, to do this. We can do this digitally. As you know, digital dentures are becoming more and more popular. I love the fact that in three shape now we can scan these scan bodies and start planning a locator attachment. It gives us the exact area and location of these uh, locator attachments where they're going to be uh, in conjunction with the uh, surgical guide. And, uh, and then with the final denture, the, these, the spaces in, internally on the denture are already done. And you know, it's, it's amazing. We can utilize um, the chair side uh, curing of these attachments or uh, in, in the laboratory. So um, I love these types of uh, cases here with the digital side. And here's a, a larger photo which a digital scan and what we're working on with these types of uh, attachments with the three shape. So uh, this is great, it's predictable and, and uh, I love using this, this type of technology for these types of cases. So let's talk, talk about what, what happens when we have a divergency issue on these cases. You know, it's something that you know, the, the, the implants were in place, place uh, in, a, in, a, in a parallel 
uh, scenario. And uh, oops, let's get something popping up on my screen here. There we go. Excuse me one second. I don't know why that's popping up. Okay, so hopefully everybody can still see this, right? Okay. So yeah, so on the locator RTX attachments, we compensate for these types of um, uh, 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 divergency issues. You know, so uh, and the uh, the divergency, uh, the amount of degree of divergency is compensated for. So it's up to sixty degrees, and which is great. You know, sixty degrees divergency issue. It, usually, it's about twenty to thirty. So we have, if you have a divergence issue with these implants are placed uh, not in a parallel uh, mode, it's amazing that what you can do. And Locator RTX is one of the newest uh, attachments out there that can compensate for this. And because it has a rotational cap that can do that, that can compensate for that. So great attachment, great solution to divergency issues. Up to 60 degrees, that's unheard of. I mean, it's, it's amazing. So, I mean, not all these implant cases are perfect, you know, especially on, especially on existing patients when you want replacement dentures or something's happening when they're wearing out these caps on, on a regular basis and spending a lot of money with replacement inserts, something's wrong. There's some sort of divergency issue and it's creating uh, the, uh, the contact of the attachment into the, uh, the nylon cap uh, and wearing it out very quickly. So this is the answer to those types of problems. And then we have ERA attachments. ERA attachments have been very popular over the years. And, uh, you know, we still utilize these quite a bit, you know, so it's another popular attachments. And I wish I had more time to cover all the available uh, options on the market that there are. There were a lot of great options really for attachments. So I'm, I'm talking about the three that really work well for us over the years and for myself on these types of cases. And this is one particular case with ERA attachments that, you know, the doctor took the final impression here. And uh, we poured it up, we poured a soft tissue model, and we, we were going to have, we had the verification index, and we we're going to have the bar made. As you can see, this bar on the right-hand side, we have a two millimeter thread with those ERA attachments, and those, atta those attachments are going to be right into the bar. We have plenty of room on this case. We, did, we made an internal structure with a horseshoe-shaped mesh framework, and that was incorporated into the, um, into, uh, the denture. And you see the attachments on the right-hand side, on the upper right are cured into that. And we had our try-in on the lower left-hand side. And there's the final case, as you can see here, on the upper. On this particular design, though, on this framework, I really would have came uh, come cl closer to the attachments and the bar assembly for more support. Uh, but on this, the design I wasn't too crazy about, I would definitely come with uh, more support mesh framework on this type of case. But it worked out, worked out great. This is the upper, and uh, we did a lower denture also with this, uh, worked out great. This is the patient, the upper and lower denture with the uh, in intraoral, you can see the picture, how nice they fit. Retentive, flanges were, were normal flanges on this particular case, because we were able to do that. Uh, and the patient's able to take it out and cleanse it whenever and clean it whenever they want to. Looks great, retentive, phonetics were great, aesthetics were great, and we had a successful case. The other system, uh, besides uh, you know the locator and uh, the ones I just showed you, uh, we just it's we have the OT equator system. It's called a three-in-one system, and it's a smaller profile than your you know your uh, locator attachment, and and the ERA attachment. It's a little bit smaller uh, lo uh, profile. So again, it's for the castable, it's for implants, it's for build bars. It's compatible with all implant brands with cuff heights one to seven millimeters with a standard two millimeter thread. And this is the equator profile. It doesn't look like uh, much now, but when you compare it to the locator, you can see it's a lot smaller. And this means so much to us when we're planning these cases, because even that small amount of space on that locator, when we're drilling a denture tooth and you have a framework over this to support, there's, sometimes there's not enough space. And we're, we're grinding a denture tooth to go over these attachments with the acrylic. Sometimes we have to grind, grind these denture teeth really thin, almost to a wafer. And what's gonna happen? You're gonna sacrifice shade integrity strength and aesthetics on these types of cases and most likely they're going to break so you really have to have a certain amount of room you know for these types of uh, uh on these types of cases for the acrylic and the denture based material so this is when locate oh equator comes into play it's retentive just like the locator and this is a picture of it being cured intraorally with four uh four locator uh, equator attachments rather and this worked out really well this case so uh, really retentive and uh, it's, it's a, it's, they wear really well. I think it's a little bit longer 
wear resistance than, uh, than the uh, locator attachment. But all of them are great. But this certain scenario, we needed more room, we, we use these types of cases. Again, there's a comparison between the two. And the same procedure you would use in any implant over tension case. So you don't have to change anything. The only thing you'd have to get is a more uh, different torque wrench on these types of cases. So this case here, I'm gonna show you here. This was an over tension bar case. I actually inherited from another laboratory. For some reason, the laboratory is having a difficult time with this case here. You can see it's a flat ridge. So um, well, no matter what, what scenario that this other laboratory came up with, they couldn't really make the dentist happy. And, and uh, so they gave it to me. They said, Dennis, can you come up with a solution for this? And, and I did, you know, uh, had a verification index made the uh, temporary cylinders here. And then we did a denture setup here, just to make sure everything after the verification index was, was okay. We got confirmation, did a denture setup here and uh, wanted to make sure the occlusion was, was good. And usually want to go to at least first molar occlusion on these types of cases. And this is the mill bar we made, you know, so we had the uh, equator attachments on top of the mill bar. And, uh, and what we did here, we had an internal framework made. This is the try-in. We had an internal framework made. We cure those attachments to the internal uh, mesh framework. So we had nice support. And this is the finished denture. I just like to show the tissue side here. And this is gonna be a strong denture. We had a bar, uh, you know, we had a, going over a bar, but we had that uh, mesh support internally. And then we had a high impact resistant acrylic. So, I, you know, pretty, this case has never come back, so it's been, it's been it's been a few years now, and it's been working out great. We haven't seen any breakages or any issues with this case. So, when it comes to framework strengtheners, if you're going to prescribe a strengthener, you will usually do that in the laboratory. We'll give you a call and talk to you about the strengthener. You know, on an upper, we usually like a horseshoe-shaped framework, so the patient can feel the the uh, roof of their mouth, and it'll be more comfortable. They can taste better, uh, and we can either have a mesh framework uh, or something like this. This is a cast, uh, cast framework we could do in the laboratory. We've gotten away from this over the years. Now, it's, uh, life is, makes, is made a lot simpler for us. We can do everything on CAD CAM now and design these frameworks in no time, and then we can cast them or have them laser sintered, which is great too. There's a new laser sinting project process for frameworks and for these types of internal structures. And then you have your super polymers uh, that, that are out there right now, you know, peak materials, pectin materials, uh, they're pretty much as strong as metal, but uh, they're lighter and they're more aesthetic. So many times we're getting these types of framework options in the laboratory also. And you can see that upper framework in, in, the, uh, in the middle here. This was a great framework. You know, it has a parallel strap. It went over the attachments. We were able to cure, snap those attachments into the framework, uh, uh, locator attachments, and we were able to process the uh, acrylic over the mesh. You know, and I have the final uh, pictures to this case somewhere. So uh, next time I got to try to uh, find those and show you, but really worked out quite well. So these super polymer options are uh, fantastic also. And this is going to, this is becoming more and more of an option, even with hybrid type cases, uh, you know, in, in the market and fixed cases also. So another divergency solution is with Ryan 83 attachments, like I just showed you with the um, uh, equator attachments. But there's only, only up to 30 degrees um, uh, compensation for divergency issue here. So you can see how there's rotational caps on this types of uh, cases and it compensates for those that divergency. And it's a nice little video here to show you actually what goes on underneath those dentures. There's a lot can go on underneath there. You know? so, uh, uh, but this is an answer and this is called smart box. And uh, it's an answer to divergency issues. If you don't have up to 60 degrees divergency issues and you need only 30, 20 to 30, this is a great solution and for small, lower profile attachments. So let's look at some of the mill bar attachments uh, options here. You know, this is these, these, you know, these mill bars that we have done for us, you know, they, they come back looking like pieces of jewelry. You know, there's so many different types you can, you can have on it, different attachment uh, types of, and uh, over these mill bars. Locator is probably the most popular. This is the dolder bar that we've used these over the years. I've gotten away from these a little bit. It's just not, they work great, but we don't get many requests for these anymore. But sometimes I'll do a combination. I'll do a combination of a locator on a bar and, and maybe a hater bar uh, attachments. It could be hater bar clips on an upper and maybe uh, on a posterior region, we'll do some locator attachments. And uh, that seems to, be, seems to work out very well. We've done a lot of those types of cases over the years. So with that, I want to get into what happens if you have a case that has a lot of recession and uh, we need to reline them. You know, so I, you know, over the years, I've gotten these cases in the laboratory where the doctor would just take a traditional reline impression. It would cover the attachments, the inserts, it wouldn't seat correctly, and it was a nightmare. So 
I'm going to go through some of the protocol, and I'm sure you've seen in cases like this in, in the operatory where you had a low reline these types of attachment cases. What is the best scenario? So that's what I wanted to talk about today before we get on with anything else. So we're going to talk about leaving the housings in and the caps in versus removing them, successful step-by-step -step operatory procedure, impression taking, border molding. Oh, this is important with these types of relines on these cases and the necessary chair side materials and patient acceptance. And we're going to talk about the existing locator orbidenture evaluation and communication with us at the laboratory. So we talked about locators attachments, you know about them already, but what happens when you have, um, you know, more, uh, we, we need to have that uh, tissue support when there's re uh, recession. Now let's talk about relining. So let's talk about the pros and cons of leaving locator housings in and inserts at the, uh, for the denture. Well, you know what? The cons overweigh the pros. You know, the pros is it saves chair time, but it really doesn't because a lot of times there's a lot of adjustments later on. So leaving those locator housings in and inserts in the denture can cause problems. There's a chance of not seating completely. The impression materials gets inside the insert. And most of the time it needs to re be reamed out and reprocessed anyway. So I recommend going with the removing the locator housings and inserts, and then taking impression over some new, new housings. And that works out great because the cons are extended chair time and higher parts expense. And the pros are accurate positioning of the housings and inserts. It's easily picked up in an impression. We can cure the housings directly in a laboratory or you can process a chair side and it's a proven technique. So the first thing we're gonna do is uh, you know, to reline these, uh, these housings, we're gonna ream out and grind out those existing caps and we want to make sure it's a passive fit. We want to make sure there's enough room there to pick up those attachments in, in an impression. So the special uh, burrs that uh, you can buy from uh, Zest that is a great kit that's out there. It's a chair side kit where you can create space with a special burr. And it's just the right, right amount of space to cure these attachments into early, even, even with um, taking an impression. So I recommend checking into those, these types of burrs here. And there's a yeah, chair side. Um, you know, why this is pop, popping up here? Here we go. Uh, and chair side recession recess burr, which is great too. And that's an additional burr that you can use also. So, and this is the chair side kit I recommend. Really great chair side kit on, uh, from Zest. And it works really well when these types of overdenture cases. So um, we looked at all the different locator uh, choices. And the thing that you wanna get in, in the operatory if you're gonna be doing this chair side is there's a kit with the housings and the inserts in there. You're gonna to wanna to have these to, a chair side, especially with the black uh, insert, uh, and it's the locator mill processing package. And you're gonna put this on top of the existing locators before you take your impression, okay? So you wanna place those caps on there, make sure that the denture is passive uh, when you take it on and off. If, the, if it's catching on these caps, you wanna ream this out a little bit more. So if everything looks good, we're gonna roughen up the borders, and then we're gonna start border molding. And I recommend putting an adhesive on the borders and, um, and just putting a little bit of a heavy body or monoface type of material on the borders. Put it in the mouth, get that musculature impression, make sure the patient's moving their cheeks and you get a nice seal around the borders and then you're ready to take your impression. And put some uh, uh, adhesive inside the impression and then you're gonna apply that impression material. A medium, I recommend a medium body on this type of impression put it over the locator caps, and many times those caps will come out inside the impression, or you can pop them right back in. Send this to us at the laboratory. We have the um, model analogs, we'll pop in there, and then we'll, put the, uh, we'll pour a model, and we can process the, uh, the reline in the laboratory. And there's your um, uh, model analogs here. So we'll put these in the laboratory, pour a model, and then send it back to you once the case is processed, and you can process the attachments interorally, or we can do it in the laboratory. But since we have the accuracy of a great impression and we have the, you know, these analogs, uh, most of the time we're processing these in the lab as opposed to having you process it in the operatory. So we will pour the master cast. We have the, uh, the housings on there. We're going to process these housings in the laboratory if we need to. And then um, this is the reline. We're going to finish and polish it. We're going to remove those black caps here. And if you have, this is important too. If you, really uh, you need to get this removal tool and insertion tool in the operatory to do this effectively. You know, we have this at the laboratory, but now we wanna put it, replace these locator caps, take that black one out, the processing cap, and put the correct retention ring in there. 
send it to you back at the operator. You insert it. If you want to do chair side, uh, chair side uh, processing, you can do that also. And I recommend uh, either the uh, Zest chair side material or URI pick material, or we have the, something called quick up. And uh, all you have to do is just put a little primer around the area where you're going to, you want the acrylic to stick to and inject this material into the hole and around the attachment and around the housing. Seat the, uh, the denture, how the patient bite down, it cures in about two minutes. It's a great, great material. Let's see how much time we have here. I'm going to just touch on all on four and six now, and then we're going to continue with part two next week. So let's talk about all on four and six now. So we've got away from the uh, implant over denture aspect of it. And then we're talking about now uh, a fixed type of uh, uh, prosthesis uh, with dentures. So you heard of the all in four uh, concept, you know, and it's pretty much with four implants and the posterior most implants are tilted at, at 45 degrees or less. It's a graftless procedure and bone grafting is avoided by tilting those posterior implants. So we've done a tremendous amount of these cases. They've been really successful over the years. Do I recommend four implants? Well, it need be, but I like at least six implants on a maxillary. This way, if one implant fails, you have five more. So. So most of the time right now, as far as uh, what we get in the laboratory, we're getting six implants on, an, uh, on a maxillary case. And immediate function, fixed provisional denture or bridge is for patients, you know, for patients meeting the criteria for immediate loading of implants. And uh, we'll elaborate more on that in part two. And if you're placing six implants, you're not gonna be placing these uh, uh, implants, the posterior implants at an angle. Everything's gonna be placed, uh, placed vertically. Sinus grafting may be necessary though. And the all-on four treatment facts, fa uh, the facts on those, these types of cases have been very successful over the years. So as long as it's favorable bone, favorable bone and tissue parameters and a stable marginal, marginal bone, you're gonna have success on these types of cases. This is like an intraoral radiographic picture of how that all-on four case looks intraorally, those angulated uh, implants on the posterior region. And most of the time in these types of cases, uh, especially all on four, we're using the multi-unit abutment concept on these. Um, and, uh, or you can, if it's it, it, on specific designs in these cases, you can go right to the implant, you know, without the multi-unit abutments. And they come in all different angles and variations from 17 degrees to 30 degree variance uh, on these types, of, uh, uh, these types of cases. So I'm gonna see if I have time to uh, talk about 3D planning software. And we have it, it's 844, it's gonna take about five minutes. I like to talk about this because it's really important that we do surgical guides and pre-planning on these types, pre-planning surgical uh, criteria on these types of cases. So uh, we utilize 3D planning software and through combing uh, computer tomography, CBCT images are designed to prepare the osteotomy and perform correct implant placement, placement utilizing the appropriate sleeves. So we do this quite a bit on these types of cases. It's predictable. You know, I've seen these planning on these cases over the years where some of them, it was guesswork, you know, so this is predictable, you know, so there's four major steps in these types of cases. We have the diagnostic data acquisition, virtual planning, surgical guide production, and surgical procedure. So let's look at some of these steps here. And diagnostic and data acquisition, that'll give us the bone volume, bone density, the anatomy of the area to be restored, the type of restoration, the type of loading, the number of implants, aesthetics, and function. So, you know, digital technology is amazing to get all this information, this data acquisition, and to communicate with you at the uh, and the oral surgeon and uh, planning planning these cases. To these these types of uh, data acquisition scenarios are, are essential, really, and they're predictable. And again, image technology for a precise digital plan for implant placement. And an impression or is taken conventionally or, or digitally. You know, so we can take that preliminary impression in digitally or, or uh, conventionally on these types of cases. So what do we do here? So virtual planning, we get the 3D data set, a DICOM, and it's imported directly into the appropriate planning software. And we have the you know, software systems that have been accurate and proven successful. And then it's merged with the scan impression or the STL. And then the implants are positioned in accordance with the patient's anatomy and desired outcome. And then we, do, we get all that information, everything looks good. We do the surgical guide production. Sometimes we'll have the implant companies do this for us or we'll print the surgical guides in our facilities. You know, so, uh, and they're, they're accurate, uh, they're precise and they work very well. And the surgical procedure, we wanna secure that surgical guide on the day those implants are placed. 
prepared the osteotomy line and recommended implants and recommended uh, surgical instruments, instruments with these implant systems. And the proper guide of surgery kit uh, you need in conjunction with the surgical protocol and the surgical guide indicate which instruments are needed at each site. So uh, and that's important to have the right instruments at each site. These instruments along with the surgical guide, guide allow for the guided insertion of the implants. So now it's predictable. Now we know where these implants are going to go. Now we can make that restoration right to those, uh, those sites rather than guessing where they are at times. Because uh, that's, that's, you know, it, and the dental laboratory's role on these types of cases, with case planning with you and on in oral surgeons on these implants, denture type and occlusion. We could be doing a brand new denture, it could be an uh, uh, um, immediate denture or an existing denture. We want to work closely with you and we'll give you in-office support the day of surgery with the denture conversion. And we have to uh, case uh, plan for that future case and final case when we do the implant bar and the final hybrid case. And we'll come in the office the day of the surgery and we'll assist with step-by-step -step procedure converting that removal processes, prosthesis into a screw retained denture. So, so we have a lot of support here through DSG to support you with these types of cases here. So with that, I am gonna end part one of this presentation. We have part two with a lot of more information here. And we look forward to having you uh, on, on part two. Also, I hope you gained a lot today from this uh, part one. There's a lot of information I gave, but I'll open it up so anybody has any questions. Dennis, thank you so much for uh, sharing your knowledge. And um, this morning, uh, great information shared. Uh, please, if you can't think of any questions right now, reach out to us at any time. We thank you for your time, your, your constant support. Uh, please know that we are going to have part two next month in March. We're looking forward to seeing you all real soon and keep those cases coming. Thank you so much and have a wonderful day. Thank you, everybody.